Okay, Isaiah chapter 6, and as I said, we'll be going through five chapters. God is uh, looking for men and women to send out, as that was my prayer, and I believe that God is still the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and He's still looking for men and women to send out in this world, whether it's in Riverside, or whether it's in San Bernardino County, or Los Angeles County, or it's in another state like Texas or Oklahoma or some of these places that don't have Calvary chapels or churches, for that matter, that teach through the Bible. And I believe God is calling men and women still to go out, if you're willing to take that step of faith, if you're willing to say, Lord, here I am, send me. Now, I just read an article that was on Christianity Today. Uh, Brian Brodison was interviewed and it was interesting that, um, that he was sharing a little bit of his testimony that when he married, Brian, uh, married Pastor Chuck's daughter, he used to work in a surf shop. And he was content working in this surf, surf shop. He loved surfing. He was in a shop where he, he surf and hung around the group and so forth. And he was very happy, content uh, to share his faith there. He became a Christian and, and so forth. And so he didn't think anything else but that. And Chuck, I guess, came to him and said, um, how would you like to, to uh, take on an internship? I'll train you. And he was kind of hesitant and says, well, you know, I'm really happy where I'm at. You know, you know how Brian is, uh, I'm happy where I'm at, you know. And, I don't know, you know. <laughs> but he took it on and uh, Chuck trained him to be a pastor. And then several years later, after he learned the ropes, he went out to San Diego and started a ministry, you know. And Chuck always believed that God leads supernaturally. In other words, he leads in natural ways supernaturally. You know, it, 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 it isn't always this great light that all of a sudden shines on you and you hear this chorus, you know, saying, okay, I'm calling you to go out into the ministry. Sometimes God just leads you naturally. A pastor comes up and says, why don't you think about the missionaries? And going out to the field and, and sharing the gospel. Well, what? Me? Yeah, we'll train you. We'll send you out. Short missions. Get hands-on training. Uh, okay. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know is you're in it and you're going, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, How did I get in this situation? How did I get in this place? That's, that's kind of where I was at, where my pastor actually um, became sick and I was an assistant pastor. And so for eight months, I ran the whole church. Little did I know that God was training me in running the whole church. And I mean from studying to the administration to the various ministries and, and so forth. But little did I know that God was going to send me or separate us where he would go somewhere else and I would stay here um, and start a small Bible study which grew into the church that we have today. Um, didn't think about it, didn't have that desire to do that. Uh, it seemed like my wife knew about it before I knew it, and even other people knew about it. I just didn't think that I could be a pastor. You know, I didn't think I was capable of being one. But the Lord apparently thinks that I am, and I still question Him sometimes and, and kind of fight with Him about it. But he, you know, He's called me to be that pastor. And so pray about it. You know, some of you that maybe are retired, some of you that don't work, some of you that um, are young, you know, and life is just hard. Why not it be hard for the Lord? You know what I'm saying? You know, why not, why not trust in God and watch what he does in your life? I know that he has done some great things. I've seen him, you know, when I've been in the valleys, and I've seen him when I've been on the peaks. And God has always been there. And, and, and I know that life is that way. You know, we have our valleys and we have our peaks. You know, so why not do it for the kingdom of God? Why not do it while you're serving God? Why not trust in Him to provide for you and watch how He does it? And it's pretty amazing when you do. And so I challenge you as we get into tonight's message that you think about Isaiah and God calling Isaiah into the ministry to preach a message of judgment, but yet of hope to the children of Israel. So let's go ahead and move on. The first uh, 12 chapters of Isaiah tell us about Isaiah's purpose in writing this book and the calling of a prophet. Now these chapters predict and lament the eventual fall of Jerusalem, that is Judea, the southern uh, kingdom of Israel. However, the arm of the Lord will protect Judah from the Assyrians, we'll be introduced to the Assyrians in these next few chapters. 
Assyria or Ashur. He was the son of Shem. You remember Noah had been stranded and had sons. Was one of them was Shem, and out of Shem came the Ashurs, and then came the Assyrians from his line, and they became a thorn in the side of Israel. And Israel will later on destroy them with God's help. Now, Isaiah chapter 6 is a mixture of narratives and some poetry and also some prophetic uh, events that will take place. Um, and, and it's interweaved as we go through each chapter. You will see the history there at that time was taking place, and then you will see it, uh, speaking it in such a prophetic way, you know, uh, with poems and analogies and pictures, you know, uh, like floods of waters and things like this, speaking of, of that they're going to come upon the children of, of Israel in that way, like a flood comes upon a people. And then within all that, uh, God just interweaves uh, prophecies, eschatology, t- the signs of the end. You know, we get the famous scripture in nine, chapter nine, or I'm sorry, yeah, six or seven, nine, I believe it is, um, where the birth of Christ is, is proclaimed that, you know, unto us a child is given and so forth. So you'll see that as we go through this, and I'll point some of those out. So let's look at Isaiah's vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now Uzziah was 16 when he became king of, Ju- of Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel. You remember during the reign of Solomon, it was divided into the northern and the southern. The southern was Judah. The northern was considered Israel. So you got to try to keep that straight. Sometimes I get it mixed up. Uh, But he was the king of Judah and he reigned for 52 years. Now, he was a good king. I have a paper, I think it's still out there, and it lists all the kings of Israel and all the kings of Judah. And it tells you whether they were good kings or whether they were bad kings. And there were more bad kings than there were good kings. Uzziah was a good king. Uh, he, went out, he, he went out to the land and he conquered the Philistines. He went into their territories, destroyed the altars, and raised up altars unto the Lord. And the Lord blessed him because of that. But he did sin against the Lord, and the Lord gave him leprosy for a while until he had repented from his sin. And then the Lord restored his, his life for a season. And so he was a good king, but at this time he, he seems to be passing away. Uh, as a king and a good ruler, the people were depending on him. They were trusting in him. He was leading them in a righteous way. And so there was hope. There was peace. There was trust in him. In fact, sometimes when, when you're living during a time where things are going right, it seems like we don't have a need for God too much, right? Because everything's going right. So why do we need to pray? When life is good and finances are good and our marriages are good and and there's no struggles in life and so there's no need to pray because everything's good. So why come to God and and pray? And so it seems like the people were trusting in him a little too much. And so once he passed, the Lord then reminds them of who his real king, who their real king is, and that is the Lord Almighty, that he is their king. In fact, the Bible tells us he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So it says that above it, above it, that is this throne in the temple there, stood Sephiriams. Now, Sephiriams are kind of like cherubims, and they're similar angels there in the throne of heaven that surround God. Each one has six wings, with two he, he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one uh, cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Now you can read about these things in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, Ezekiel chapter 1 and, and chapter 10. Go back and read those chapters. I hope that you've read Second Chronicles chapter 23 to 32 to, to see the events of when this was all taking place. It will give you some history, uh, a little bit of a homework. And, and when you get to heaven, you'll be able to know what's going on. You'll be able to say, you're Isaiah because I read about you. You know, I, I saw what you did and, you know, during this time instead of going up there and just kind of walk around. I have no idea what's going on. You know, that's why you got to get into the Word of God. You got to study it. You got to know it. And so when you get there, you're going to see the throne of God. And you're going to see sephirims and, and cherubims and angels. And they're going to be singing, holy, holy. And you're going to go, wow, this is exactly what the Revelation said in chapter 4. And you're going to say, wait a minute, watch the saints as they throw the crowns to the king because you're going to be ready for it. Instead of kind of walking around, what's happening? And people are telling you what's happening. 
You know, don't let that happen. Get into the Word. Revelation 4, chapter 5, Ezekiel 1 and 10, and, and read about those things. Now, Isaiah saw his own sin. It says in verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of, the peop- of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, Isaiah is a prophet of God. Uzziah was the king of Israel, or Judea. As a prophet of God, Isaiah realized that he was a sinner, that he had flaws, that he wasn't perfect. In fact, he realized that even the people themselves were people of sinful nature. And so he says, woe is me. A good leader, if you have a good pastor or a good leader and someone that's leading, he will understand that of his own strength and power and even his own nature is sinful. Is sinful. I was listening to an interview, a guy who served with Billy Graham, and the guy asked him, um, how did you get to serve with Billy Graham? He says, well, they interviewed a bunch of guys. And as they were interviewing these guys, uh, they would go to one guy, and the guy says, okay, here's my qualifications. I, I served with this man. I studied at this school. You know, I had this degree, and I studied at another school with this degree. And they went down the line, and everyone gave their credentials. Everyone gave their statistics. Everyone gave all their good qualities. And when they came to me, I said, woe is me. I'm nobody, you know. I, I'm just a servant, and I'm here just to serve God. You know, you want to know where I went to school? I can tell you, but really, I don't even deserve to even be here. It would be an honor to even be a servant, you know, and so forth. And guess who they picked? It was him. You know, because he understood his place. You know, he understood that he was a sinner. You know, I, I run into guys, and, and they're, they're so positive about who they are and, and the gifts that they have and, and what they can do and, and how they're going to do it. And, you know, and I kind of wonder, well, where's the woe am I? You know, it's only by the grace of God that we can do what we do. And Isaiah sees God sitting upon this throne. And when you see God upon his throne and they're saying, holy, 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 you realize that you're not as holy as you think you are. You know, so like Isaiah, you say, woe am I? Woe am I, a man of unclean lips? You know, who am I to dare to even teach God's word? It it is a sacred word of God that's eternal. Not one dot will pass away. Everything else will pass away but this word. And so when we approach it, we need to approach it with reverence and, and respect and love and not taken away from what it says and so forth. So even as a pastor, we need to realize that, that it's a privilege and an honor, and yet I don't even deserve to be up here. You know? And I understand that. I know my flaws. Oftentimes I may not tell you, and you probably know my flaws too, and you'd like to tell me what my flaws are and so forth, but I probably already know them, and I probably already bring them to God every day. You know, I I don't deserve to be up here. I went and taught last Friday at another church at a couple's uh, dinner. And um, I shared with the church on Sundays that I I feel unworthy to even teach there. Here I am at a couple's dinner, and yet my marriage isn't perfect. You know, there's a lot that I still have to learn that I have to do, you know. And and I just felt so unworthy to, to even go there and to share. But I shared, and God, through his grace, not anything of me, he was able to minister to those people that were there. Well, how do I know that? Because they came up afterwards, and and they were blessed by the words of the Lord. And not my words, and I know that it's not from me, but it's from God. So when we truly see God in his holiness, it should humble us. It should humble us. If you have pride, if we think that we have the answer to church growth, if we think we have the answer to a, a fresh new look of God's word, we're wrong. We're wrong. We, we have to approach it with humility. And that was Isaiah. Woe am I. Woe is this nation. Then one of the Sephirims flew to me in verse 6, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, that is Isaiah, here I am, send me. 
Now, I love that because it is the Lord who cleanses you. Though I am a sinner, though we are sinners, it is the Lord that takes coal and he cleanses our lips and our iniquities by the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that, that we are righteous before God, that we can do good works because they're done in the Lord Jesus Christ and not our own flesh. If we do it of our own flesh, out of pride, out of arrogance, or to show off our our skills and our gifts, then we're doing it in the wrong way. But if we do it in humility, knowing that God is using us as a tool, then glory belongs to the Lord. Because He's cleansed us. He's washed us. He's washed our iniquities away. You know, he's taken all your sins and He's put them on the cross. And Jesus bore them and even the guilt of them. And so He remembers them no more. So we're righteous in God. We are sons of God. We sit on the throne. We're already in the heavenly places. But it's not our work. It's His work. He did it. See, He sent someone to take coal and cleanse him. Isaiah could not cleanse himself. It was God who took away his iniquities, who purged his sins. And so then the Lord says, whom shall I send? Now what a call. And I think he's still saying that today. Whom shall I send? Who is willing to go? Who's willing to step up to the plate and say, look, I want to be sent out. I want to go somewhere. I want to go to the missions field. I don't want to just sit. You need to get busy then. You need to start training. You need to get ready. I remember years ago, there was a guy who was called to go to Russia. And so he he prayed about it. Calvary Chapel was behind him. It was before the wall went down. It took him 10 years before he went to Russia because the wall wasn't down yet and missionaries couldn't go in there and stay. And so the Lord was preparing him. He got married, which was a good thing because a lot of Russians where he was going were married. So that was a good thing. Not only did he get married, he decided that him and his wife would go live in a state that was very cold so he could get used to the cold as he went to Russia preparing himself. Well, when he was in the state very cold, he started having kids. Of course, it's cold. And so, so he has a lot of kids, you know, like eight kids or so, if I remember correctly. And now that was a good thing because in Russia they have lots of kids and so they could relate. And then all of a sudden the wall comes down and he's ready to go in preach the gospel. God was preparing him for it. And he was preparing himself because he knew that God was calling him to do that. You know, but you have to prepare yourself. You can't sit on that chair right there and just say, okay, I'm just waiting for the Lord to do it. No, get up off your bottom, you know, and get involved and start doing something because God is saying, who shall I send? And we should be saying, here I am, send me. You know, do something with me. Use me. Use me to reach out to my community, Re- reach out to the state of California or whatever it is. You might even have a desire for your high school, you know, or high school friends, you know, but the Lord is waiting for us. And, and you know, I think that if when we are honest with the Lord that we're sinful and we're undeserving, then God says, you're the man I need. You're the one I want because you won't be lifted up in your pride and your arrogance. You'll depend upon me. So God's calling. And then it says that Isaiah saw this great, the greatness of his responsibility. Verse 9, he said, go and tell his people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitants. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men from away, far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. So God used Isaiah as an instrument of judgment upon Israel, but also an instrument of hope. Go tell them this is what's going to happen to them. This judgment is going to take place, but also know them there's going to be a remnant that's saved. And there's always that hope behind it. You know? Now, God uses Isaiah here in a great way. And it reminds me of what Paul said, that, that God gave himself some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. God wants to equip people for the work of the ministry. My responsibility as a pastor and as a leader is to equip you for the work of the ministry. How do I do that? By teaching you what I've learned as a Calvary Chapel pastor. 
taking what Pastor Chuck has taught me through my study of Pastor Chuck and of Calvary Chapel Ministries and passing that along to the next generation. That's how we do it. And so we have leadership meetings. We're about 10 guys now. Uh, one, one or two dropped out. So now we have about 10 guys, you know, and um, we're training them. And hopefully they'll feel a call and hopefully we'll send them out. That's my hope, not just to keep them here, which is nice. And we need some here. We don't want to send you all out. But if that's what the Lord wants, then you all go out and you serve the Lord. And then you reproduce yourself in that way. That's what Chuck did, right? And that's what he did with Brian Brodison. Well, while you're sitting there selling surfboards, why don't you uh, come in internship with me and I'll train you? And boom, he becomes a pastor. And he did that with 12 men, didn't he? With Raul Reese and, um, you know, Mike McIntosh, Steve Mays, and all those guys that, that uh, he brought under that were just young kids that, that said, wow, use us, and made it simple to teach the Word of God. Now we come to chapter 7. Now, Assyria, we're going to see, will be invading in these few chapters, 7 and 8. It was a nation in the northern Mesopotamia in the Old Testament times that became a large empire during the period of the Israelite kings. It started off small. In fact, Assyria and Assyrians were two different nations. And then Babylon came along, and then the Persians and the Medes came along later on. And these were nations that were growing up and raising in power as, as they were conquering other little cities and towns and then other nations and boom. And Syria and Assyrians were always battling against each other and just depend on how powerful they were. One would lead and then the other one would lead. One would be conquered, the other one would be conquered and, and lead and so forth. So at this time, the Assyrians are, are growing in strength and God is going to use them as an instrument of judgment upon Israel. Their, their expansion into the region of Palestine uh, was about 855 B.C. They had a, an enormous impact on the Hebrew kingdom and Israel and Judea. So Israel attacks Judah without success here. Now there seems to be this civil war where, Jude, where Israel gathers with some other nations and they're trying to take over Judah. And so it, it, it's uh, in a sense a civil war because they're fighting against their own people, their own Hebrews uh, that were divided. So verse 1, and now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jothan, the son of Uzziah. Now Ahaz is the king at this time, king of Judah, that Razan, king of Syria, and Pekan, the son of Remeleth, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. Uh, there's God's protection over his people, as he promised. Now this other king of Syria joined the Israelites to battle against Judah, but they weren't successful in it. And it, came, and it was told, verse 2, to the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and, hearts and the heart of his people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shirjazhub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller fields. And say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted, for, for these two stubs of smoking fire brands, for the fierce anger of Risen in Syria and the son of Rimelach, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Rimelach have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its walls for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. So he's encouraging Judah here. Don't worry. You're going to see this, this great nation coming against you, two nations gathering together, and they're going, to seem, they're going to seem invincible, but yet don't worry. Hang on. I will be there. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rizan. Within six years, Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people. And the head of Ephraim in Samaria, that is Samaria is the capital, and the head of Samaria is Remelath, son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So again, God's encouraging them to take care. Do not worry about it. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord, your God. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above. 
But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, it is, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? And so he's saying, ask the Lord for a sign. But he wouldn't ask. And the Lord wanted him to ask for a sign so he could give him a sign so that he would know I'm in control. I will take care of you. And so he gives him a sign anyway. He says, therefore, verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Crude and honey he, will, he shall eat that he may know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. So we see his, history here, but we also see prophecy here. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Who's that speaking of? Jesus. Jesus' birth through Mary, the virgin, and so forth. And then we see the historical evidence here that within a few years there will be someone born and by his birth they will be totally annihilated as a nation, Syria. And Israel will still be there, but they won't be effective any longer. So you see that interfolding there of the prophecies. So there's like a twofold prophecy. And when you see prophecy in the Old Testament, a lot of times there's two folds to it. There's a historical uh, evidence of it, and then there's the prophetic evidence of it. And in this case, we see the, the virgin birth. And I'm not going to get into all of the, the uh, commentaries on the virgin birth, the, the Jews who are against it, using the word virgin as, as more maiden, and it wasn't a virgin birth. Just by the fact you see Mary, and you see in the, Old Tes- or in the New Testament in Matthew and the Gospels, um, they point to the scripture and they talk about this virgin birth uh, is in evidence enough that she was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus Christ, which is a miracle in itself and a sign. And God gave him the sign, even though he didn't ask. Assyria here is to oppose Judah and Judah is to experience this hardship and decline in the next few verses. The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house. Days that have not come since the days of Ephraim departed from Judah. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will uh, whistle for the fly that is in the furthest part of the rivers of Egypt. And for the bees that is in the land of Syria. They will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the cliffs of the rock and all and on all the thorns and in the pastures. In the same day the Lord will shave with the hair's razor, with those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the heads of their hair, of their legs, and all, or and will also remove the beards. And it shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk uh, they gave that he will eat crude, for crude and honey everyone will eat, who is left in the land. So because of this utter destruction, because they come upon him like bees and so forth, as he's describing this, there's less people, so there's more milk for people to have. So it's not that there's more cows and availability of milk, it's just that there's less people to to um, actually give milk to. So we see the destruction that's taking place here. And it shall, and it shall happen in that day that whatever there could be, a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for bears and thorns, with arrows and bows. Men will come there because all the land will be come bears and thorns. And to any hill which could be dug with a hole, you will not go there for fear of bears and thorns. It, 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 it will become a range of oxen and a place for sheep in Rome. So that desolation that will come upon them as God's protecting them. Chapter 8. Now, in chapter 8, Isaiah's son is born as he prophesied in the previous chapter and, and uh, he then fulfills that prophecy. Historically, moreover, the Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalach Hasbaz. Uh, Close enough. You can try to pronounce it yourself. (laughs) And I will take for myself faithful witnesses to record uh, Uri the priest and Zechariah the son of, uh, yeah, 
Jeber Sheerth. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Meir Shaph Beth Hethbas. So he did. For before the child shall have knowledge or to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. So that prophecy being fulfilled historically, just like Isaiah prophesied in chapter 7. And then in the future, Jesus will be born of Mary, fulfilling the second part of it. So the Lord also spoke to me again, saying, verse 6, And as much as these people refuse the waters of Shiloth, that flow softly and rejoice in Risen and in uh, Rimeleth, son, son that, who, is, who was Pekah. Now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty, the king of Assyria, in all his glory, and he will go up over all the channels and go over all its banks. So he's gonna con- Assyria is going to consume them like water, like a flood. He will pass through Judah, he will overflow and pass over, and he will reach up to the neck and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breath of your land. O Emmanuel, be scattered, O you people, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourself and be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves and be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Boy, underline that. God is with us. God is with you. He is with you always. You're out there in the world and you are enduring whatever hardship you're enduring, you're suffering, even your own repercussions and sins. You know, oftentimes we sin and we suffer those repercussions of our sins because we make bad decisions. But you know what? God is still with you. God's still with you. He still loves you. He still cares about you. And he still wants to use you. Because it's not about you. It's about his love and his grace. That's what it's about. We need to remember that. As a church, as believers in Christ, yes, we're to be light, we're to be salt. But it is the love of God that causes men to repent. It's the love of God and the grace of God that has turned us to him. Because if it was the hatred of God, I wouldn't be here. If all I heard was, you're wicked and evil, and I can't use you, you know what? Okay, I know. <laughs> I'm going to go do my thing till I die. You know, but it was God's love and saying, I forgive you. But I keep sinning, I forgive you again and again. See, God loves you. And he loves you even while you're sinners. He loves you. That's why he paid the, the debt on the cross. Past, present future he knows you're going to sin in the future tomorrow you're going to sin it may be a big one a whopper you can't believe you did it but if you confess it god is faithful to forgive you why because he said that he'll never leave you he's always with you because he loves you and he understands that we're broken vessels that we're no good it's when we start practicing the sin And we keep practicing day after day after day after month after year after year that, yeah, then he'll put you up on a shelf because you're just in total rebellion. But if you fall short and you're sinning or you take a month and you're just really messing up and then you go, oh, Lord, I got to stop this. He then goes like, boom, he's right there. I'm here to help you. Let's get back on track. You know, you've been derailed all wrecked up here, but we'll get you back on track and start going again. You know, because he loves you. Because he's with you. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He, he begun a, a good work in you and he's faithful to complete it. God did the work in you and it's a good work and even though you might mess up, he's going to complete that good work in you. So remember that. He loves you. Don't let the enemy lie to you. You're not worthless. None of you are worthless. You're valuable. If you weren't valuable, Jesus wouldn't have come to this earth and died on the cross for you and for your sins. You're very valuable. You're the apple of his eye, the Bible says. He understands the pains and the sufferings that you have. I mean, the psalmist says that he collects your tears in a bottle. He 
He collects your tears. So when you get to heaven, he's going to have a bottle with your name on it and all the tears that you shed while you were on this earth. And he's going to remember you because he knows your name. That's how much he loves you and cares about you. He's an awesome God. He's an awesome God. It's the love of God that causes men to repent, to turn to him. <clears throat> For the, I would say the first six, seven years of my walk with Christ as I was learning to walk more righteously and he was removing things, it just seemed like the more that I got to know him, the more I realized I had more sin in my life. And it could have easily gone to the point where I said, look, I can't do this. You know, I'm such a sinner. You know, I'm not, I, I can't continue to serve you. And he just, he just continued to reveal to me my love and my grace towards you. And that is the only thing that has kept me going and kept many men going is that God is a forgiving God. I mean, he told Peter, you know, how many times do you forgive someone? Seven times 70. And that's in the Hebrew an infinite number. You don't stop. Especially when they're asking, forgive me. And if you're asking God, forgive me, he says, for what? Because he forgives you that quick. It's already forgotten because he loves you. Verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me, with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the ways of this people, saying, do not say a conspiracy, considering all that this people call a conspiracy, or, nor be afraid of their threats or be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hollow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. He will be a sanctuary, meaning peace, a place where you can go find refuge and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, that scripture sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus is a stumbling block, right? He's the cornerstone that they rejected. So either he's going he, he's gonna to fall on you or you're going to fall on him. Either he's going to crush you and he can crush you and, and send you to Sha'al separate you from him for eternity or you can fall on him in, in mercy and grace and he will receive you. It's up to you. And many among them shall stumble and they shall fall and be broken, be, be snared and taken. Beautiful prophecy. Jesus is our rock. Now Isaiah and his disciples looked to the law and to the testimony here in these few verses, uh, not to the dark pagan practices of of the time. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord had given me. We are for signs and wonders is Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they shall, or when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Now, this is a pretty amazing. What, what's happening is you have all these mediums and channelers and people who have died and, and princesses or kings and, and idols that they worship and they go to, and they're all dead, and they're asking for signs and wonders and healings and direction, but they're all dead. And God is saying, why would you go to something that's dead, that's not alive, that does not even exist, instead of going to someone who's alive? God is alive. He's, he's the God of Jacob and, and Isaac and Abraham. You know, They're alive because God is alive. Why would you go to an idol that can't even speak or see or talk? You know? Go to God. He's alive. He knows all things. It's amazing how so many people will look to the dead for guidance. I mean, even today, they're still looking for the dead, right? Come on, you've heard it. My grandmother came to me in the middle of the night. She's dead. How can she come to you in the middle of the night to give you directions? She's dead. Why would you even go to your grandmother when you have someone greater than your grandmother? You have God. Yeah, but it was my grandmother. She knew things that nobody else knew, so it had to be. There are demons who know things. There are demons around us right now that have been around forever. They know your grandma. In fact, they know your great-grandmother. They know that your great-great-great-grandmother because they've been around forever. And so they can come to you and they can say things. And you're going, wow, this is amazing. No, it's not your grandmother. She's dead. It's a demon. 
deceiving you. Call on God. Why would you call on, uh, on some demon? I mean, there's shows all over TV, right? Mediums. They're channeling their ancestors, you know. You know, I, I watch some of these shows sometimes because they just crack me up, you know. And the guy will be standing there and he's like, oh, I, I, uh, <laughs> someone's speaking to me right now. You have a, a mother. Oh, and she loved flowers. And someone's like, oh, wow, my mom loved flowers, Oh, yeah, and she would put them on the table. <gasps> but she did that all the time. You know, and the, and the person that's up there saying this can see the reaction. Someone's going, oh, oh it's you. Oh, how did he know it was me? Because, you know, you're getting excited. You know, and that's how they get you. They manipulate you. And then it's, you know, well, now I need some money. You know, help me out a little bit, you know, so I can continue on to go all over the place helping people. When in reality, you're not speaking to anybody because they're dead. You know, they're dead. And then, you know, it's just interesting. And she just wants you to know she's okay. Oh, God. she's okay. Good. I was wondering if she was in heaven or not. You know, she's okay. And, and don't worry. Oh, wow. She knows I'm worried. You know, it's just amazing how you can manipulate people. It's demonic. But people still do it. it it's just crazy. Let's go on. <clears throat> Verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass. Let's stop. For a second. They don't speak according to this word. What word? The word of God. If they're not speaking the word of God, then there's no light in them. You know, dead can't speak. <laughs> Only God can. You know, that's garbage. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but scripturally, the Bible is clear. There's only one God and one meteor between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. No one else. Everything else is, is demons. Everything else is, is deceptiveness. You know? And if they're not speaking the word of God, if I'm not speaking the word of God, then don't listen to me. Uh, that's truth. Yeah. And we need to be careful with that. It, it's amazing how people will deceive you, isn't it? You, you watch these TV evangelists. You know, and I've shared this before. There's this one guy that comes on every Sunday, he's, every Sunday, and he starts talking about the Lord. The Lord uh, knew I needed a suit. I needed a suit, and so I'm Lord, you know, I need a suit because I got to go to Oklahoma and, and minister to those people. But I need a suit. He goes, and so I pray to the Lord, give me a suit. And so all of a sudden, I get a call, and it's a friend of mine. He says, Hey, the Lord just uh, ministered to me, and he said, I, I need to buy you a suit. And he's like, praise God, you know. And he's like, that's what faith is. When you call out to God and you, you pray to him and you say, Lord, by faith, I'm going to believe you can give me a suit. And so then he goes on and says, man, so I was walking to go get a suit. This guy, you know, said, go over here, charge it to my account. And I was there. I meet another friend of mine. And the guy says, the Lord told me to come here and buy you a suit. He goes, praise God, now i got two suits. You know, so he's like going on and on. Next thing I know, he's got a whole whole closet full of suits because people are calling up from all over the place the lord told me to give you a credit card just buy a bunch of suits you know and then at the end of all of this he says now the lord wants you to plant a seed in my ministry of faith you know thousand dollars five thousand dollars you know people are going wow he got a suit i could get a suit you know and let me plant some seed money in there you know and, and give this guy and watch god take care of me you know and it's garbage it's garbage and old ladies you know are are looking at their bank accounts. They're going, oh, I need to give this guy some money, you know, and he's ripping them off. I feel sorry for him when he stands before God in his nice suit, you know. Uh, and God says, you're separate from me. You, you're a, you know, a harling. You're a false prophet. You bis mislead my people. That's not what it's about. Um, <clears throat> see, Chuck has taught us well, one of the philosophy is that we serve God because God's called us not because we get paid for it. Here, we don't, we don't send out mailers. You know, they'll send out mailers. People will send out mailers. Churches will send out mailers. Send out mailers because you want to get donations. We don't do that here. We don't solicit donations. We just trust in the Lord. You know, in fact, um, many times um, people have suggested that we get programs to help people to give more and so forth. And, you know, I've thought about it, but then I always fall back. What Chuck has always said, where God guides, he provides. So I don't want to do that, you know, and I, I don't want to encourage or manipulate people to give. They give because they love God, as Roman put it so well today, you know. But um, that's why they give. And so we don't do that. I, I, I go to speak somewhere. I, I remember a couple of years ago I went out to Hemet, 
at a men's home. I didn't expect to get anything. I did it because I love the Lord and I want to minister to the guy. So I went out there and I didn't expect to get anything. And I didn't get anything. And that was fine. You know, because I do it for the Lord. And I was able to minister to them. And I went to this couple things not expecting anything from them either. You know, And Chuck has taught us that. That you go and you minister. Because that's what he did. And he was that example for us. And it's funny because there's so many pastors now that will... You gotta be careful here. <laughs> that that will get with other churches and like, I'll go speak at your church and you give me something and you come speak at my church and I'll give you something and you know and they're making extra on the side like that and that's that's hireling, you know that's not right. You know they're not willing. So many times we get people calling us up, musicians. Oh, we love to go and just share our gift. God has really really gifted us and we have this passion and worship and so forth and all we need you to do is put us up in a room and feed us and take a love offering and all that stuff and I always just go delete 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 you know I don't do that at all you know, Dennis Agajanian was here you know, several years ago and he said I'd like to just come and minister to your people and I says well we you know okay he goes yeah I'm not charging you anything I'm out in the area so I just thought I'd come out and do it and he did he came out and did it now, I took a love offering for him, and people gave him whatever they gave. You know, we just gave it to him. He was happy with that, you know. That's how it should be done. It's not for money. We don't do it for money. We do it out of love and because God has touched us. That's the way it should be. <laughs> they will pass through it hard, uh, pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Ugh, I feel sorry for those guys. All right, chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon, the land of Neptuli, and afterwards more heavily oppressed her <clears throat> by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of, of the Gentiles. Now, in chapter 9, he's going to be talking about crisis coming. Now, he's talking here to the northern part of Israel. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Now, he's talking about us right there. Jesus came. Now, it wasn't the Jews, but we Gentiles were in darkness, and we saw a great light, and that is Jesus Christ. And thank God for that. that God opened up our eyes and that we could see the light in Jesus Christ. Because we could have seen some dimmer lights in other things, but God opened up our eyes to see the light in Jesus Christ and who He is. Uh, and that is a blessing, and that definitely is grace in our lives. Because we were lost without hope, living for ourselves in a dark world. And all of a sudden, truth came into our lives, and we responded to that truth that came into our lives. And thus we were saved. And so this light that came into the world was to the Gentiles, to you and I. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nations, increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the shaft of his shoulders, the rod of his oppressor, as in the days of Median. For every warrior sandals from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning the fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We all know that one, right? It's all in the Christmas cards right there. So you get the, the human perspective and the divine perspective here. Unto us a child is born. Jesus was born into the world. Unto us a son is given. Divine Son of God comes into this world and then fulfills all this. So the government will be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We have the peace of God because Jesus is in our heart. And so another fulfillment of prophecy there. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And he did. Prophecy fulfilled. <clears throat> it's amazing how there's critics out there of the Bible, and they break up the book of Isaiah in three, in three sections. And they say there are three different writers. 
but they're writing under the name Isaiah. Okay? Because how can one writer write about something in the future when he wasn't there? You know, and it's just, you think about it and you go, well, God had them write it down because God knows the future. You know, obviously men don't know the future. You know, they can't foretell it. But if God reveals it to them in a vision or a dream, then yeah, I could see them writing it down. But they don't believe that. They don't believe in miracles and signs and wonders. It's kind of like the Sadducees and Pharisees, right? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They couldn't understand and see how a body could die and then resurrect from the dead. So they didn't believe in it. And the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, so they were this battle and division among them all the time. And we see that today. Well, they don't believe in miracles. Really? God is a God of miracles, signs and wonders, and he hasn't changed. I think if you just believe Genesis chapter 1, you won't have a problem with the rest of the Bible, right? If you believe that God said it and it existed, you don't have a problem with anything else because God said it. The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hew stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, Lord shall set up the adversaries of Razin, again the Syrians, against him and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people do not turn to him who strike them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. How sad. Here God's hand is stretched out to them. Come on, come on. You could be drowning in, in a pool or in the ocean. You know, and this guy comes along with a boat and says, grab my hand. And you look at him and you turn around and you go off. It's like, just grab my hand. Come on. I mean, that's what God is doing. And they said, no, we'll rebuild. No, we'll, we'll, we'll reestablish things. And God says, no, you won't. I'm going to send them upon you. You won't grab my hand. All God wants you to do is just grab his hand and live by grace. Live by mercy. I love that. We were at the pastor's conference, and I was just really blessed with these guys that went with us. Um, Dave, David Guzek, uh, taught out, they taught out of the pastoral epistles, 2 Timothy, and he mentioned something about the pastoral epistles. that You notice that when Paul writes them, he uses mercy. Uh, I think in the beginning or the end, I can't remember exactly. But he says it's, it's different than the other epistles. And he says, you know why? Because pastors need mercy. They need mercy. He says because they're sometimes knuckleheads. They don't make good decisions. You know, they're dumb. You know, and so they need mercies from the people. You know, they need mercy from their peers. And so me and Virginia were talking about it. And Virginia says, no, I think it's more like um, we need to know they have a good heart. And they want to do the right thing, but they don't always do it. And so we have mercy on them. You know, so we were discussing that. And, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I can see that too. You know, but I think it's more like we're dumb sometimes. We don't even know what we're doing you know, and so forth. And that's how I feel sometimes. And yet God's grace there. I just reach his hand and say, Lord, you just take me because I don't know what I'm doing. You just somehow put it together. You do it. And I'm going to trust in you because I don't have the ability. You know? And these guys that, that went with, with us saw that I didn't have the ability. <laughs> so they they wins one Wednesday night they said you know what let's pray for you and so as they were praying they caught what David Guzik said and they were praying for mercy that they would have mercy towards me that when they see me they would have mercy and I, I was just like blessed like wow wow so in other words they're prepared for me to make mistakes and they're going to have mercy you know, that that's the attitude that uh, we should have towards one another and because God's hand is stretched out. And if we hang on to him, uh, we'll just let him do the work. You know? Therefore, the Lord will cut off head, cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elders and honorable. He is the head, the prophet who teaches lies. He is the tail. Um, for the leaders of his people cause them to err. And those who are led by them are destroyed. Like, 
this is a reference also to uh, the Antichrist who will mislead them, the false prophets and so forth. Therefore, the Lord will also uh, or will have no joy in their young men nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer and every mouth speaks folly for all his, this his anger is not turned away but his hand is still stretched out. For the wicked burn as fire, it shall devour the bears and thorns and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like raising smoke. Though the raft of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, together they shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Wow. Is is our God a merciful God? He is. (laughs) Amazing. I love the Old Testament. I mean, it just shows you right there through all of the history and their rebelliousness, and God's hand is still there. Let's finish up in chapter 10. <clears throat> Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. Woe to them who do that. What will you do in the days of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you Leave your glory. Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners and they shall fall, up, fall among the slains. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is, what? Still stretched out. Woe to Syria, the rod of my anger, the shaft and in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation, against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize and spoil and take the prey and tread them down like the mere of the streets, mire of the streets, yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations, for he says, "Not are not my prince altogether kings? Is not Kelno like Karshemish? Is not Hamath like Erpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdom of the idols whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Because their idols have offended God. And so God will take care of them also. Are idols more powerful than God? Of course not. Therefore, he says in verse 12, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the kings of Syria and the glory of the haughty looks. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like the nest of the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could he wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a shaft could lift up as if it were not wood? What he's saying here, he's saying is, I will do the work, and you will not receive the glory. Let me say this again, and I've said it over and over and over again. When we serve God and we are working for God and we are seeing fruit of God, God receives the glory. You get an axe. You hold it in your hand and you cut a tree. Do you boast about the axe? Do you say, what a beautiful axe. How wonderful you are. Do you shine it up and polish it and parade it around because it's the best axe ever? No. The axe is the tool. You're the one that used the tool to cut the tree down. 
So God uses us as tools. So why do we take the glory from God when he's the one using us as an axe or as a, as, as a tool or a rod and so forth? Whatever we do, glory belongs to God. From, from all, you know, 20 years of, of doing this ministry, 25 years, I've always said glory to God. It's not me and it's not you. And when we rob God of his glory, then our rewards are right there in front of us when someone comes up and says, great job, and pats you on the back. And you go, hey, thank you. I know, that was a good job. You got your reward. Instead of saying, praise God, glory to him. We need to remember that, that we're instruments. A carpenter does not glorify the hammer or the saw or the drywall, nails and screws. No, it's the carpenter who gets the credit. It's the carpenter who gets the glory that's able to put it all together. <clears throat> a woodmaker who makes a piece of furniture doesn't glorify the bandsaw, you know, doesn't glorify the lay. He glorifies the carpenter or the furniture maker because he's the one that made it look the way that it is. And so God is the creator of all things and he's created us. So he gets the glory for this, not us. And we need to remember that. And he's telling them that right here. Who are you? You're just instruments. I'm the one that picks up the axe and will chop this nation's down. I will protect you. I will do the work. And so glory belongs to God. Well, that doesn't feel right. I know because our culture teaches us it's the opposite, right? It, it tells us that we should get the glory. We, our esteem is so low already that we need to puff ourselves up. No, we're already pretty puffed up. You know, We need to give the glory to God. Without God, we couldn't even breathe because he keeps everything going in this universe. And so glory belongs to God. Let's finish up. Therefore, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his bears in one day. And it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them down. So a child will be able to count how many are left because there's so few. And it shall come to pass in that day that a remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And so he's speaking there of the tribulation period. There's going to come a day where Israel will repent. A great revival will take place, and God will use them once again. And that's coming real soon. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For through his people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return, the destruction decree shall overflow with righteousness for the Lord God of hosts will make a determination end in the midst of all the land. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. So just like Egypt, they'll try to conquer you and entrap you and enslave you. Yet a very little while and indignation will cease as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like a slaughter of medium at the rock of Orbed as his rod was on the sea. So he, or so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from his shoulders and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. And that yoke upon their neck in Israel is the Antichrist who will try to control them in the end times. Let's finish up in the last few verses here as Assyria then will be destroyed. He has come to Etheth and he passed uh, Migron at Mish Mikmash. He has attended to his equipment. They have gone along the ridge. They have taken up lodging at Giba Rimeth is afraid, Gibeah of Saul is fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Gileam. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish, O poor Athish. Uh, Madish, boy, ha has fled. The inhabitants of Geben seek refuge. As yet, he will re remain at Nob that day. He will shake his 
fist at the mount of the daughters of Zion, the hills of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will loop off the broth with terror. Those of high statues will be hewed down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forests with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So God will deliver them from the Assyrians. Let's pray.